Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Jennifer Nordstrom, and I'm honored to serve as the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's senior minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all you're bringing with you today and all your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests who are joining us today. If you're visiting for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello in the chat now and tell us where you're joining us from. I welcome everyone into our worship service by inviting you to repeat our first church mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Let's go now to our beloved sanctuary to light the chalice which is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Hello, my name is Patrick Mulvey and I'm honored to be your worship associate today. Those of you who know me, have no doubt heard me talk about Rock Island State Park, uh, which is a very special place, very important to me. I've camped there almost every year of my life and it is uh, sacred ground. Uh, it's so important to me that uh, I've told my children, my son and my daughter, that I'd like to have my ashes uh, scattered there. And in fact, I've even picked the spot. And uh, so I wrote it down last time I was there. Scatter my ashes here in the dark, quiet cedar grove. The pieces that were my body will become parts of the soil, the trees, their leaves. When the wind rustles, part of that sound will be my voice telling you I love you still. You are my number one. You are my princess forever and ever and ever. I am always with you and all that I had is yours. Come here when you can. Let my tree leaves see how you've grown, where you've gone, who you've become. I will shiver with pride and sway with joy. Bring your children. Tell them the stories you remember. Tell them I am here still with them and their children and their children's children. These trees, will live long. They'll die too, and become parts of other things, maybe new cedars, maybe thimbleberry bushes, maybe sand on the path or the beach, maybe even part of a little hatchling crayfish, so quick, flitting backward through shallow, shallow waters with its beating curled tail, gone behind a rock or under a wave, so fast you only see it after you've seen it, and it's already gone. So I wrote that as instructions, but also as a message to my children and hopefully some comfort for them after I'm gone. And I was thinking about this the other day, and it occurred to me, all of that's true. Parts of me, I hope, will still be there. But parts of me will live on in their memories. And I know we say that, we talk about memories, but what got me was that their memories are physical things inside their brains. That that part of me in that way will also persist, not just as an idea, but as an actual neurological artifact 
inside their minds, their brains, and the minds of all who remember me. And from all of these things, I take some comfort. Before I begin the sermon today, I just want to acknowledge that when some of the communication went out about this service, there was a little bit of, of a typo. I had entitled my sermon this morning, Jesus is a Phoenix. But in that little typo, there was a mistranslation and it got sent out in some of the communications as Jesus is in Phoenix. So I just want to acknowledge that if you are here hoping to learn what Jesus is doing in Phoenix, I don't know. Uh, that's a sermon that I have yet to write. But this morning, I am going to talk to you about the sermon title that I did prepare, which is Jesus is a Phoenix. In Greek and Egyptian mythology, the phoenix is an immortal bird who dies in a fiery explosion and then rises again and again from its own ashes. In the fifth century BCE, Heroditus described the bird as having partly red, partly golden plumage, while the general make and size are almost exactly that of an eagle. 
in the fourth century CE, the Latin poet Claudian described the phoenix as having, quote, a mysterious fire flashing from its eye and a flaming halo enriching its head. Its crest shines with the sun's own light and shatters the darkness with its calm brilliance. Its legs are of Tyrian purple and its wings of flower-like blue are dappled with rich gold. The story goes that the phoenix lived in paradise a beautiful, perfect land beyond the sun. But after a thousand years there, the phoenix grew tired of perfection and flew out into the land of mortals, our own world. It's, it made its nest and it turned to watch the sun god fly his chariot across the sky. As the sun rose and the chariot flew, the phoenix sang a song so beautiful, so haunting, that all the world stopped to listen. Even the sun god stopped his pursuit across the sky and listened to the phoenix's song. When it was over, the sun god turned away and continued his journey, and as he left, a small spark dropped from his chariots and onto the phoenix's nest, lighting it on fire. The phoenix burst into flames and burned to ash. But three days later, the phoenix rose up from its own ashes and began the cycle again, a cycle which would repeat every thousand years. One of our members asked me last week to preach about how to have hope in the face of the potential of nuclear war, of climate apocalypse, and the utter devastation in which we find ourselves living right now. Those threats are real. The losses we're living with are real. The nest of ashes in our midst is real. And, and throughout human history, we human beings have faced unimaginable loss again and again, and we have risen from it. We have loved through it. We have sent our hopes forward through history like an arrow shot out to the seventh generation. The stories we tell, the Greek story of the Phoenix, the Jewish story of the flood, the Christian story of Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection. These are stories of the human heart choosing to go on beating after the worst has happened. They are stories of life rising up again after fire and flood, violence and death. It may not be the same life, but life rises again. Life will continue again and again. We are not so strong as to annihilate this insistence. It is beyond us. In time measured in thousands of years, light years of distance in eons beyond us, we may die. <laughs> Indeed, we will die and we will properly grieve for that for our bodies and our loves but life itself will not die it will change and it will keep rising again in her book take what you need life lessons after losing everything Unitarian Universalist minister Jen Crow writes about what she learned after her house got struck by lightning and she and her family lost everything in a fire. She tells the story 
of the four of them running out of a burning house in the middle of the night, kids clutched to their chests and pajamas on. And then she tells us what happened next. What happens next? What happens after the fire, after the flood? What happens next after the unimaginable, impossible thing, the tragedy, the horrible loss? What comes next? Reverend Crow writes about this through the lens of her life, and she writes about her life through the lens of love. Her thesis is that in life, in any situation, you should take what you need and leave the rest of it behind. And her sub-thesis is that what you need is love. She's not sure what else you need. That's for you to decide, but she's pretty clear about the love part. Chapter three of the book is entitled, Take It In a little bit of love. And she begins that chapter by telling a story from a novel, the book Afterlife by Julia Alvarez. In Afterlife, the main character is a woman who loses her husband to a sudden and terrible heart attack. After his death, he starts showing up for her in her life in other ways, in new ways, quote, guiding her decisions, arguing with her in the car, loving her from beyond the grave. Then the woman's mother, who is also dead, begins showing up as well in similar ways, giving her advice, telling her how to deal with difficult situations. When the woman feels like she's in a hopeless situation and it seems like there's nothing she can do that will improve anything, her mother advises her, when nothing else can work, let's see what love can do. Her mother's love reaching her from beyond the grave saying, let's see what love can do. after the fire, after the flood, after the divorce, even after death. Let's see what love can do. In the Christian story of Easter, the Jewish leader and prophet Jesus of Nazareth is crucified by the Roman Empire for organizing resistance a member of a colonized minority of people living under the rule of a massive and violent empire, Jesus preaches to his followers about love and faith and resistance. He calls on them to feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, care for the sick, visit the prisoner. In his ministry, he breaks Roman laws and he challenges Jewish authorities who choose empire over the Jewish people. Eventually, he's too big a threat to the prevailing order, and he is arrested and tried and sentenced to death by the deliberately cruel Roman torture of crucifixion. But the story of Jesus doesn't end there. It doesn't end in the ashes of torture and death. Even though it seemed hopeless, love entered the story and made something new rise up from those ashes. Jesus's community picked him up and carried him forward into history. In the face of utter devastation, they carried love forward by telling his story and the story of how his love flowed through them, through their community, even after his death. In the stories the early Christian community told, three days after his death, 
Jesus began appearing to his followers, speaking with them, giving them advice, loving them from beyond the grave. Sometimes Unitarian Universalists struggle with this part of the story because it's supernatural, beyond the laws of life and death. There are Christians and Unitarian Universalist Christians who understand this story literally. There are also Christians and Unitarian Universalists who understand it as a metaphor. It's up to us to take what we need and leave what doesn't work for us. What do you need to be able to access this story and its connection to our Unitarian Universalist history? What do you need to be able to make authentic and respectful connections across faith? In the story of the phoenix, right before the majestic bird's death, it sings a song so beautiful, the whole world stops to listen. A song so beautiful, the sun god himself stops his chariots and turns to hear. That song is still being sung today in stories we tell of the phoenix rising up from the ashes again and again. In the story of Jesus, his song is sung by his community after his death. Even after they lose him to devastating violence, they continue to feel his love. They felt him there with them, talking to them, walking with them, sharing his message of love conquering all, singing his song that death does not win, that the truth of love is bigger than death and it lives beyond it. Through the power of that love, Jesus' community comes to believe that despite horrific violence and the incredible pain of their loss, the empire cannot crush them if they let love live through them. If they use it to keep creating communities of hope and resistance throughout the land. When everything seems hopeless, when the worst, the worst has happened and it seems like nothing can help, Let's see what love can do. Let's see what love can do. There are reasons human beings find different ways to tell the story of rising again after unimaginable loss. First of all, we need them. We need stories like this to guide us through the dark night of despair, to give us hope in the face of fear, to tell us there's a possibility when we have experienced utter devastation. Second, <laughs> we tell stories like this because they're true. Maybe not literally, but they speak to the truth of the miracles love can work after unimaginable loss. They speak to the truth of life itself rising again, even though it is changed. If you're not on board with the literal resurrection of the body, that's a piece of the story you can leave behind. But there is truth and hope in the resurrection of life, whether that is through the Christian community continuing its resistance to empire and its love of the people through the church that lasts to this very day, or whether it's through the ghosts of our loved ones haunting us with their wisdom and their love living in and on and through us, or whether it's through the grandchild of the lost beloved being born and looking just like him. Or even if it's through understanding 
that there are seasons of extinction on planet Earth. And even if we all die, life itself will rise again in new forms, in new places, in new eons. Time is larger than us. Life is larger than us in a nearly unfathomable way. But we can see that huge truth in the small resurrections of beauty this spring, of descendants living on, of new love and new hope springing forth always and again and again after death even after the worst of it. I can't promise you the worst won't happen. It does sometimes. And death happens. But the truth is, so does life. Death comes and life rises again and again and again. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting is true on a grand scale, one that allows for mystery and change and death to be part of it, part of the cycle. We do not know what the future withhold, will hold. And I cannot promise that it will be without suffering. There may be fire and flood, violence and death. There may be war and climate change and unimaginable loss. We will die. And life will carry on with some piece of us in it. And I don't know what that piece will be. I don't know if it will be living on in the memories of our loved ones, or if it will be in our stories being told or our songs being sung. Maybe it will be in our molecules returning to the earth and becoming nourishment for future flowers, or maybe it will be our dust becoming the stardust of future planets. I don't know the scale of time or transference, the when or the where or the how, but I do know life goes on and we are part of it. Life rises again and again like a phoenix from the ashes every thousand years or like the beauty of its song being sung in community. So my friends, sing. Sing a beautiful song, a song of love and hope and wisdom that will outlast you, that your community will pick up after you are gone and hear you singing in their ears, loving them from beyond. May it be so, and amen. It has been a blessing to be together. May you go out from here nourished and renewed and use that to choose to bless the world. Until we meet again, may you be held, may you be healed, may you be whole. Blessed be and amen. We are going Heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know.